Alright, so in this video I'm going to take a look at simple harmonic motion. I'm going to look at some of the key principles behind it and derive some of the equations that you're going to be using in this topic. So first, some key terminology. Um, we need to talk about displacement in the context of this. So for an oscillating object, displacement is defined as the distance of the object from the midpoint of its oscillation. And we have something called a restoring force, which is essentially a force that acts to try and accelerate the object back towards the center. So say with a pendulum, what you do is you displace it initially, so you give it some displacement, and then what will happen is a force will attempt to accelerate it back towards the center at all times following that initial displacement. So let's actually describe what we mean by simple harmonic motion. So it's an object that's in oscillation, and the magnitude of the acceleration of the object is actually directly proportional to its displacement, so that's the magnitude, but it's always in the opposite direction. So if it's displaced to the right, the acceleration is back towards the left, back towards the middle of point of the oscillation. Okay, so let's dig more into some of the graphs and the mathematics of um, a simple harmonic motion system. So, um, the displacement of an object in simple harmonic motion can be expressed using this graph, which you can see is a cosine type graph. So let's try and generate an equation for this. So its amplitude we're going to call A, uh, so that's what it oscillates between. It's a cosine graph. So now what we need to try and do is work out what goes inside the brackets. So there's going to be a t because it's a function of time. And what we need is an expression that at each time period, so for each time period, essentially the whole expression in the brackets becomes 2 pi. So what we're going to have in here is a 2 pi over t term. So when little t equals big t, we can see that inside the brackets equals 2 pi, which would put it, put it back at its amplitude again. And you will often see this equation written in the form with frequency in it, um, because we know that frequency is 1 over time period. And for the purposes of this video, I'm actually going to express it in just a simpler form like this just saves me writing out stuff later on. But whenever I write k, what I mean is 2 pi f. Now, we know that velocity is the derivative of displacement with respect to time. So cos goes to minus sine, and the k is going to come outside. Sine k t like this. So that's the velocity, and we can see that the velocity is always going to be in the opposite direction to the displacement, because we've got the negative sign here. Um, so we can see it's a sine graph, essentially, but we can see that it's a minus sine graph. So let's have a go at sketching that here. So if it's a minus sine graph, it's going to go down first, then up, and down, then up and then down as it goes through a full cycle and we can see that it's oscillating between 2 pi f a and minus 2 pi f a uh, is the amplitude of that graph as we can see from the equation that we have generated. So that's velocity but we, in the definition here, we've talked about the link between acceleration and displacement. So we're going to need to take a, another derivative here and take a look at the graph. So we know the acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Um, sine goes to cosine and the k. And then it's going to be cosine t, and we'll recognize this expression here is actually just the displacement, so what we can put in there 
is just the displacement here. So let's have a look at some key features of this. Uh, let's highlight this one because this is one of the key equations that you will use uh, later on. So we can see that the acceleration is going to be in the opposite direction to the displacement, which is something we described earlier. And we can also see the acceleration is directly proportional, so the magnitude of the acceleration is directly proportional to the displacement. So it has all the features that we were looking for in the description earlier. So we can see that this is a minus cosine graph. So let's sketch a minus cosine graph. So it's going to go something like this. So it's just a reflection of a cosine graph in the x-axis. And we know that it's going to oscillate between k squared a or 2 pi off squared a and minus 2 pi f squared a. So those two are the same there. So that gives us essentially an equation for the acceleration here and some other key equations we've got here that you can put to use later on. And then if we just quickly compare these two graphs we can see this one and this one are just uh, reflections in the x-axis of each other and we've got uh, So those are the equations for the different properties um, as you go through oscillations in simple harnic motion. So whether it's a spring system or a pendulum or anything else in SHM, uh, they, these are going to be the graphs that describe them as a function of time. Okay, so that's that. So we can actually generate some additional equations to solve problems. Um, so we're going to start with... Um, this equation that we've had just now. Like this one. So the first equation that often you often see is actually an expression for the maximum acceleration of an object in SHM. So you'll get maximum when x is maximized and x is maximum at the amplitude, so you get this expression like this. Now we'll do some a bit of complicated calculus in a second to generate an expression for the velocity and the maximum velocity. Don't worry if you can't quite follow what I'm doing in this, you may not have done that kind of calculus, this is something you'll develop in the mechanics part of maths. Um, but I'm going to show you how to get to a velocity term. Now a key thing you may or may not know is you can express acceleration as v dv dx. Now um, what you can do is you can substitute in dv as dx by dt and you'll see that that's the same as saying dv dt um, but let's not worry too much about that. Um, so what we get is essentially from here so what we get is v dv dx is minus k squared x. So we've got two partials, so what we're going to do is integrate to get rid of those. So we're going to integrate um, v by dv, and we're going to integrate, let's get the k squared outside, x by dx. So we need to set the limits, so we think the displacement's going to start at the amplitude, um, because that you have to initially displace it, and it will end at some uh, displacement x. Velocity starts at zero, you can see because it's a sine graph, and it's going to end at some value v. Okay, so let's work this through. So you end up with half v squared to minus k squared uh, k squared uh, no, it's not. It's x squared minus a squared. Come over by 2, because remember you'll get the halves when you integrate. So these end up cancelling. And what you get is v is equal to k square root a squared minus x squared. And remember that k is 2 pi f. 
And what that gives you an expression is for the maximum velocity of it will be when um, x is 0, because you get maximum velocity at um, 0 displacement, so you just have this term, x term will cancel out, so you just end up with 2 pi f a there, because you're just square root of a squared. Um, so these are two key equations with uh, k su substituted in for 2 pi f in those cases. So you get these two key equations, and then you have uh, these two as well. So as I said earlier, the way you've got to those isn't particularly important, though it's useful to know. It's these equations and using them that's going to be important. And um, in terms of setting the limits and stuff, it's a bit of interesting calculus, but don't worry about it too much if you don't understand it. Alright, so let's look specifically at some spring systems. So we can actually generate specific expressions for a spring system. So, we know that when we have a spring and we stretch it, the restoring force is going to be given by f equals kx. Um, but we also know it's acting against uh, the motion of the object, so actually we get the restoring force is given by minus kx. Therefore we know the acceleration is going to be minus k over mx, just using Newton's second law there. And we also know that that's equal to minus k squared uh, x there. Um, actually, I'm going to substitute in the 2 pi f straight away so we don't get confused with the k's because these are actually different. This one's the spring constant. And we'll cancel the x while I'm at it. Uh, and we can cancel the minus signs. Okay, so just to clarify, those two k's are different, which is why I've quickly substituted in. And then we can get an expression for the frequency. So we square root it and divide by 2 pi k over m. Or you very often see this in its reciprocal version. The time period is 2 pi square root of m over k. So these are two equations that apply specifically to spring systems with uh, one spring on an object so you set it in oscillation by pulling it down or pushing up initially but we get these two expressions we can use with spring systems okay likewise there are some specific uh, equations we can use to do with pendulum systems so the first key thing to recognize the restoring force if we displace it by an initial angle theta, uh, the restoring force is the one that's like acting that way, which is going to be uh, the mass of the object times acceleration times sine theta. So essentially what we're doing is resolving the weight force into perpendicular components, because your weight force is acting there, and what we want is the part of it that's going to make it move, so that's the bit perpendicular which is this one. So then we can get an expression for the acceleration just as we did before. So that's just going to be g sine theta. Now we know that that's going to be equal to x. Oh, I should have uh, put the minus signs in here. The restoring force is against the motion. Uh, so we're going to get these minus signs, and then obviously with the minus sign in there, which are going to cancel out. And we also need to work out what the displacement is, the x. So if we say the length of the object is L, this length here is going to be L sine theta. So let's cancel the minus signs. We end up with G sine theta is equal to 2 pi f squared L sine theta because that's this distance here, that's your uh, displacement. So you can see we can cancel our sine thetas just like we can cancel our minus signs here. And we get an expression for the frequency. So we're going to divide by L. So you get G over L and a square root to get rid of the squared and then times by 1 over 2 pi. 
and then again you often see it in the form g like this uh, so we get these two expressions here again the logic to how I got there is not particularly important but you do need to be able to use these equations and apply them in different contexts with different pendula. Alright, so last thing, we're just look at, going to look at the different types of energy in the system. So you learn about this in year 12, the different types of energy, and we're going to look at how they apply in a uh, oscillating system in SHM. So first of all, let's get our expression for the displacement of the object. So we had A cosine KT. Now we know that the potential energy stored in a spring is half uh, K X squared. Um, God, I need to stop using Ks. Let's change this one to a C so we don't get confused. So potential energy is given to give half K A squared cos squared so we can see it's essentially the potential energy is just the displacement graph squared and multiplied by a few things. So if we look at squaring the displacement graph, we're essentially going to start higher up on this, and it's always going to be positive because it is going to be a positive number. So what we're going to do is it's going to come all the way down to zero just as before. Then what it's going to do is come back up, so it sort of goes like this, uh, a little bit neater than mine, quite frankly. But you get the idea, essentially it's always positive, and it's that graph squared, using our knowledge of springs. If we look at the kinetic energy, um, we know that the velocity is given by... using our C instead. And we also know that kinetic energy is half mv squared. So that's going to be, um, so we're going to end up with uh, minus a half m c squared a squared sine squared ct. Uh, pretty sure that's right. Which looks absolutely horrific, but essentially what it's saying is We've got the velocity graph squared and multiplied by a few things. So it starts at zero, so we should start our graph at zero. It's going to go up to a peak and then oscillate back down to zero again. So what we get is a graph that looks a bit like this. And th this here is the essentially the amplitude of this graph here. All right, so that looks a bit complicated, but essentially how we're going to use this if we add this graph, the kinetic energy graph, to this graph up here, the potential energy graph, what we get is a constant, because all the energy is assumed to be conserved, so all the potential energy is transferred to kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is transferred back to potential energy during a cycle. So if we add them together, we should get a constant, assuming that there's no work done against uh, resistive forces like air resistance and so forth during the oscillation. Um, so that concludes this video looking at some of the different principles. Um, just to reiterate again, don't worry too much if you don't understand the mathematics of what I'm doing, but make sure you know the different graphs, make sure you know the different equations and you know the energy transfers that are going on and you can describe simple harmonic motion and you'll be well on the way to doing well at this topic.